Hello and welcome to another episode of Unstuck with Hypnopunk. And I'm broadcasting here today on my new Yeti microphone. So very excited about it. So it will no longer sound like I am in a Pepsi Cola can. So today's uh, episode probably should have been the first episode that I did. It's the, um, the origin story. But just like whenever I give talks out there, um, I just came back from a conference uh, this weekend, the Canadian Hypnosis Conference. And oftentimes people will go out there and they will bang on about how great they are and why you should listen to them for about the first 45 minutes of a 50 minute talk. And there's very, very little content that you get to take away with. What I learned from uh, Jason Lynette is essentially go out there, give your talk, and then earn your introduction, earn whatever you're going to say next and talk about yourself. But let people care about you and what you do before you force feed them. Hence why we're doing the origin podcast today. How did I get into hypnosis, change work and all that good stuff? What am I all about? Why am I here? So that's what today's show is going to be about, ladies and gentlemen. So in reality, how I got involved in hypnosis is um, when I was a young kid, I was very fucked up. I had every kind of problem that you could imagine. Um, I spent years uh, going through child therapy and family therapy from about the age of nine to about the age of 17 or 19. So so a big long hole right there. Uh, my I didn't get along with my parents, uh, who had a, a very interesting relationship. Uh, I would get bullied at school. Um, I had no friends. I was obese. I uh, couldn't get a girlfriend. I uh, had asthma, nearly died of uh, whooping cough as a youngster. I uh, had ADD. <laughs> I was very depressed, very anxious. I was anxious before anxiety was a thing. Uh, basically, I uh, pretty much had every single problem that you can imagine out there, other than I was not sexually abused or beat up by my parents. Uh, other than that, I pretty much had um, every kind of problem you can imagine. I don't say that to uh, have sympathy from you or a hard luck story, because everyone has hard lives. It just gives you an indication of, um, of perhaps how I got into this. So um, I, I'd been involved in child therapy, and uh, really, really nothing worked. Uh, I went to a children's home when I was... Um, when I was 16 and that was the greatest year of my life there, being around other youngsters realising that I was not the only person in the whole wide world who was a complete fuck up. Um, And I'd gone through all these uh, forms of therapy um, and nothing quite frankly helped me. I was was suicidal, I actually tried to kill myself when I was 16 by taking a bunch of um, paracetamol uh, and my dad's heart medication along with um, another another bunch of medication, another bunch of tablets I found in uh, the medicine cabinet at home. Uh, And if I'm honest about it, I I don't know if I really want to die when I was 16, but um, I I certainly want some help. I was certainly fucked up and and, and nothing was nothing was working. Just everything was 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 horrible and tough for me, to be quite honest with you, for whatever reason. And um, I think it's probably more of a cry for help the first time I try to commit suicide. But I was I was truly in a dark place. Um, and I remember that um, I, I got taken to the hospital and uh, they leave me alone in this room after a while and they realise I wasn't going to die and they're looking for a bed to put me in and I just remember actually before that my dad come home and this is not to say my dad is a bad man or anything like this right? it was just his gut visceral reaction when he came home um, he, he saw the tablets he came home with my mum and they picked my little sister up from school and um I told him what I did, and his um, his response to me was, "Why couldn't you do this at night? Why couldn't you do this when everyone was asleep? Or why couldn't you go down to the railway tracks and basically jump in front of a uh, train?" Um, so if I was looking for any sympathy, I, I certainly didn't get any um, at that time. Um, so that didn't make matters that much worse. Um, so that happened um, kind of in 1995 when I was about 16. And um, before I got put in a children's home six months later, um, I ordered a audio recording. Um, it was in actually the newspaper, the News of the World, that's now defunct in the, uh, the United Kingdom. And it was um, for an audio cassette. It was, it was before MP3s and CDs were not even hugely big back then. It was still in a 
time where we got um, audio cassettes, they were the thing. And this audio cassette was called Supreme Self Confidence. And it's by a chap called Paul McKenna. That if you know anything about hypnosis, you've, you've probably heard of this guy. He had a uh, long running, at least five years, uh, TV show in primetime network TV in England uh, every Monday night, I think at seven or eight o'clock um, in, uh, in the 90s. And it was a kind of show where. Um, it's kind of like a almost like a stage show that you put on TV every week, where he's getting people to do um, silly things. But because it was TV, and it was happening on TV, I totally believed it was real and it would work. And Paul McKenna, very successful uh, hypnotist, uh, trainer, and author, actually the number one, I believe, uh, published uh, author in uh, in England. Um, so I got that. I got that audio cassette. It took about twenty one days or twenty eight days to arrive, and. Um, I had to get my sister to write me out a check because I was too young and I didn't have a check to get this uh, this audio cassette. So I waited eagerly for it to come, like uh, 21 days, 21, 28 days, eagerly waiting for it to come because I knew this tape would change my life and I knew it because I watched it on TV and like, well, if he can make someone sing like Madonna or dance like Michael Jackson, do the moonwalk, he can give me some supreme self-confidence. Tape comes. The tape is 22 minutes side A, 22 minutes side B. The first side is explaining what hypnosis is and what it isn't, and the second side of the tape is the actual hypnotic, um, the hypnotic part of the tape, I guess. So I listened to it religiously every day, and I had total belief, total expectation this would work because it had to work, didn't it? Because this guy was on TV, and whatever we see on TV it must be real. Remember, this is way before the internet and anything like that. Um, and quite frankly, that stupid, generic, um, ten-pound, twenty-dollar uh, tape that I did pay my sister back with my Saturday job, it changed my fucking life. Uh, it made me have self-confidence, and um, it, it, it did more for me than than basically ten years of, of, of therapy and going through the ringer. Um, and it started to change things for me in, in, in a very, very positive way. Um, and I'm like, well, there's something to this. There's there's something there's something to this. And um, I remember when I left this children's home, um, I had gone to America a couple of years later as part of a summer camp. And I'd always wanted to go to America as a little boy, but my parents would never take me away. Um, I think they took me away when I was two, and they told me one time on an aeroplane, and I cried for two weeks, and they took me to Italy, and they never took me away after that. Um, so and I had no recollection of that. So the, the first time I got on a plane was was when I was seventeen, eighteen. It was to go to to New York. And I'd always wanted to go to New York. So I grew up on a diet of uh, American wrestling. I still do. And uh, 80s vigilante shows, as I like to call them, like the A Team and and Knight Rider and uh, Magnum, and my personal favourite, the Equalizer. Um, and I just loved that. Um, I loved that American culture. Always did. Still do. And so I ended up going to New York, working on a summer camp for fat kids, quite frankly. Um, and long story short, I ended up getting fired because um, the rebel in me came out and these kids would beg me for candy. I let them buy some candy and I was awoken unceremoniously one night about 12 uh, midnight when uh, my whole dorm had been evacuated and there was three men standing over my bed. I remember, I'm a 17, 18 year old, first time out of the country and they're like, come with us. And they took me into an office, and uh, no, that didn't happen. But they, they took me into an office, and um, they uh, basically unceremoniously fired me from a job I wasn't getting paid for, anyways. And they basically said, "If you put up a put up a stink, you put up a fight at all, we'll call the NYPD, and um, we'll have you taken out of here in a squad car for um, for feeding kids caddy." Um, so I ended up uh, ending up in New York City. Um, they withheld my uh, my visa, my um, passport, the company that had placed me for this uh, famous um, summer camp in uh, the Catskills in New York. So I ended up having to live in New York City Times Square for about um, six weeks as a 17 year old. Um, I'd run out of money and there was no way for me to get home because of the visa situation. So I'm completely out of my element and I, and I ran out of money. Um, and to make money um, as a youngster I used to study magic a lot and um, 
uh, on my first day in New York City in Manhattan, walking around Times Square, um, I'm ushered into this um, this side um, this side house, this on the street with with all these shops. There's this little uh, little staircase with a door, and these three uh, bl- three very very big black men. Um, they kind of ushered me up this um, this up staircase, and, and as I went up there, there's free card Monty going on. And if you've ever been to New York, you've, you've probably seen this all magic where there's free cards on the table, and one of them is essentially the queen and they shuffle just these three cards and if you can tell where the queen is uh, you get to win the money that's in the pot and if you don't you lose however much money uh, was in the pot so I go up there I'm kind of uh, hustled if you will but because I used to do magic I, I, I knew how that they would force cards and stuff um, so long story short I win and I win a bunch of money and these very large black men are not very happy with me and so I took the money and I ran the hell out of there and then these uh, these uh, three uh, rather um, angry gentlemen ran um, after me all around um, Times Square and um, Central Park I somehow gave him a slip um, but luckily I had enough money um, I had a considerable amount of money to survive on for the next six weeks is, is, is what I did there in New York City and um, i tell you why I get into this because I finally got my um, passport back uh, my visa and I'm at JFK airport I'm about to go home and I'm quite frankly feeling a bit of a failure because I'd, I'd always dreamed of going to uh, to New York to America but specifically New York and it it turned out to be a bit of a nightmare to be honest with you a horror story and I'm at the airport JFK and um, I'm waiting for my flight and um, it's been delayed so I walk into a bookstore and quite frankly uh, I was about 18 at that time I'd probably read two books up to that point that had been forced upon me on school and I think one of them was Romeo and Juliet I, I hated reading I-, I did not like reading I did not get the value of reading certainly books that were forced upon me but I find myself and I think it was a Waterstones or maybe a Blackstones in, in a JFK airport and I'm in there and my flight's been delayed and uh, this is before smartphones and internet and all that stuff so I'm looking for something to distract me to be honest so I'm in there and uh, my attention to, for whatever reason is um, is transfixed to the top shelf and no there's no dirty magazines in there get your mind out of the gutter it was a bookshop it's a respectable bookshop it was uh, it was Waterstones and um, it was this book it's very thick heavy tomb with this gentleman with a very chiseled jaw on it and a, an executive suit and haircut and I picked up that book and it was um, called Unlimited Power by a guy called Anthony Robbins and I'm sure none of you have heard of Anthony Robbins before and um, I got on the plane this book was huge I mean it's small text quite dense about 550 pages and I just um, I just ate that book up on that flight home I think I actually read that book on the flight home I mean crazy I read the book and it was this guy who was um, he was helping people but he wasn't a counsellor and I always knew I wanted to help people but I didn't want to be a counsellor and he was also getting to perform Form. Yeah, he was not an actor or a singer, and I, and I was not an actor or a singer, but I wanted to perform. And um, he'd put together this system of um, that he'd learned, I later learned, that it was a neuro linguistic programming and hypnosis and fused it all together to, to his system of NAC, neuro associational conditioning, I believe it was what, what it was called. I'm like, that's what I want to do. I always knew I wanted to help people, but didn't want to listen to people bitch and complain for years and years and years and not get fixed. And I always want to perform, but um, quite frankly, I cannot sing. And um, and my acting is questionable at best. Um, and it was at that point where I'd, I'd put that hypnosis tape that I'd got many years before, well, a couple of years before, and what Tony Robbins was doing, I'm like, that's it. That's what I need to do with the rest of my life. And I come back to the UK and... Um, and I did, again, I was researching NLP and neurolinguistic programming and what this was. And again, the internet was in its infancy there, so it was very hard to research this. I was going to the library a lot. I bought Tony Robbins' follow up book, Awaken the Giant Within, and it just, again, it was really a syllabus of neurolinguistic programming, if we were honest there, but Tony calls it something else. And I just vocaciously just, just, just ate that up. I'm like, yeah, that's what I need to do. Later on that year, a few months later, I found myself a kind of mind, body, um, spirit Expo, where you have all the earthy, crunchy kind of holistic um, practitioners there, and I'm walking around, and um, there's a hypnotist, and a guy I can't quite remember his name, but he was selling you know audio cassettes and stuff, and it appeared on a uh, a uh, breakfast uh, morning TV show called um, Good Morning in, in the United Kingdom a couple of times. I kind of remembered him there. He was giving away ten set ten minute sessions, so 
he did some stuff with me kindly and to, to be honest it just honestly felt like someone was talking to me but I was very thankful for his time he seemed like a nice guy and I, I bought a couple more of his audio cassettes and as I'm walking around um, I ended up at um, a table um, uh, for an NLP and hypnosis and timeline therapy um, um, stand there uh, from the performance partnership which had been around about 25 years David Shepard's company in uh, in England and um, I kind of picked up their brochures of NLP and hypnosis and timeline therapy courses they were running. Remember, I'm an 18-year-old kid, essentially, and uh, these courses were about £2,000, which is about $4,000 back then, so I didn't have that kind of money. And uh, quite frankly, I was pretty much homeless at that point as well because I wasn't really living at home and I had no fixed abode. I wasn't quite living on the street, but I also didn't quite have a home. Um, and I had no money, I had no jobs. Um, oh, because that was another thing as well. I was uh, the government had claimed that I was suffered from you know deep depression and um, would pay most of my, most of my bills for me back then. I had that crutch, um, but I knew that I needed to do this course, but there was no way for me to afford it. And I remember walking into a bank one day. I had no co-signer. I had no um, no means of paying back this uh, loan. Uh, I had no job. I had nothing and I, I knew I needed to find the money to do the practitioner and master practitioner and trainers training of um, hypnosis NLP and timeline with a performance partnership and um, it was about £10,000, £20,000 which, which is a lot of money and it was certainly a lot of money um, 20, 25 years ago um, but somehow I convinced the uh, the bank manager to um, to give me a $20,000, £10,000 um loan and I took that money and um, didn't buy drugs, didn't buy alcohol, I didn't do any of that stuff, uh, I gave it all to the performance partnership to train me on these courses and I think up until that point I was the youngest um, person they ever had on a uh, on a training and I um, I got my uh, my certification after doing my prac, master prac, trainers training on uh, hypnosis, NLP, timeline which is all very, very good in the uh, very very early noughties, late nineties and I remember there's a lot of people in these courses, although they were, you know, the nearest person to my age was about 10 years um, older than me. So I was go, I would go there. I was terrified. You know, I didn't have any really social ability back then. I had learned all these skills, but quite frankly, I had no idea how to put them into practice, how I was going to make a living at doing this. I just knew that I um, just knew that I needed to help people and, and make a change. And then I kind of dabbled with it, really, for the next couple of years. Had another career that was going on concurrently after that, where I became a fitness trainer. But but my passion was always the psychological aspect of um, of, of what I did. And so quite frankly, I, I burned all that money, did did very little with it. Um, then went on doing another bunch of certifications with, with people like Valerie Austin in a One Hour Stop Smoking um, course and, 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 and many others. And I really wasn't until after I studied with Valerie Austin and she had a nice system together of how to do hypnosis specifically for stop smoking but for other courses as well a nice A to Z if you will on how to structure a session and what to deliver that actually did a few sessions um, and was paid for it for smoking um, and for uh, heights fear of heights fear of phobias and did okay it was, was pretty okay of it but um, I didn't quite know how I was going to turn this into a living. Um, so I kind of stuck safely in, in some means, I guess, with, with, with being a personal fitness trainer. But I always want to go, go into this more. And I kind of deviled, stayed in that fitness uh, field for some time. And, and I moved to Canada about uh, eight, nine, ten years ago now. And again, I was still, I kind of knew that I needed to, to do something with this hypnosis, but I'd, I'd gone back to what I knew in the fitness realm because I'd been very successful in there and did good work, but really my heart was not there until eventually about five, six, seven, eight years ago. That's a big, that's a big jump. It sounds like I'm lying. In actual fact, it was probably about six years ago. I'm like, you know what? I need to uh, pursue this hypnosis thing um, more and do it more full time. Um, even though I'd been involved 20, 25 years in some form or fashion with it. Um, and I remember I worked for a company called Good Life, which is the big chain of gyms here in Canada. And, and my boss had found out about my hypnotic background. He's like, would you mind doing a bit of a hypnosis show in one of our meetings? Because they're really boring. People get tired and it'd be good light entertainment. And quite frankly, I'd, I'd done a few sessions, but I'd never done performance hypnosis phenomenon or anything like that. So I'm like, sure. And I just shitted it at that point. I was like, oh my God, I don't know how to do this. This is absolutely terrifying. So I remember um, I, I um, got Anthony Jackwin's um, um, 
Manchurian Candidate program and um, I just basically did that uh, I just learned it I made lots of notes and I actually delivered it um, and, and hypnotized someone um, for real in the meeting and this was a guy that didn't like me I, I didn't particularly like this guy either we did not have good rapport and um, but I hypnotized him and he was a bit of a jock if you will and I hypnotized him to believe that this two pound weight on the floor he couldn't pick up and he couldn't pick up and um, I'd done a bunch of phenomenon and it all and it all worked and, and people were shocked by it and no one was more shocked by me and I'm like oh there's something to this stuff and um uh, I ended up leaving the fitness realm um, and kind of getting more and like I have to do this I have to do this hypnosis stuff and I have to do it full time and I have to dedicate the rest of my life to it by hypnosis I put all change work under that umbrella as well so then I just got into hypnosis full time basically and um, by full time what I mean is I only make my living off of hypnosis and no other money come in I cut off all the other ties I cut off all the comfort of making money from doing things that I was good at but didn't protect particularly have that that passion for and just pursued hypnosis full time and I'm um, very grateful great very, very grateful for doing it so that's a, that's a little bit about my origin story and how I how I got involved why I got involved with hypnosis and you know just just to tell you it cured my uh, asthma I know I'm not supposed to say it cures things but I had whooping cough I was on inhalers uh, multiple times a day and nearly died of whooping cough I think as I mentioned earlier and then one day after listening to my hypnosis tape as a teenager I'm like I'm gonna take up fitness I'm gonna take up martial arts and I'm just going to stop taking my uh, inhalers I'm not suggesting that you should do that but it's something that I did because I've never asked my clients to do something that I wouldn't be willing to do and I never had an asthma attack after that never had a whooping cough attack after that it just ceased to be and haven't used that inhaler what for like 22 24 years now i've been the most physically active that i've been ended up dropping i don't know about 50 pounds with with hypnosis um really developing um you know uh, social acuity and uh, becoming an entrepreneur and if, and if it wasn't for hypnosis if it wasn't for me getting in hypnosis getting my mind right and making these changes I, I wouldn't be where i am today i wouldn't be asked to speak at these events like hypno thoughts and the, the canadian hypnosis conference and, and kind of make the kind of living that i am now and really affecting people really positive change um, and it was all it was all because i was a fucked up kid and I didn't want anyone to have to go through the loneliness, the, the agony, the anxiety, the depression that I had to go through as a kid. Um, I wanted to be able to get in there and, and help people, but not help people listen to them be bitch and complain and be sympathetic, but be empathetic and help them to rapidly change their life as, as hypnosis helped me to do and that's that's why I got involved in this. this is why I'm passionate about this this is why I continually push that envelope and I always if you're a change worker I always suggest that you find a style that works from you take from lots and lots of people but you put your own your own twist on there you don't try and be a cardboard cut out on someone else you get all these skills that you're going to accumulate from many many people but you feel it through your own experience hence why people come to see me and one of the one of the feedbacks i get which is actually a great compliment but in the past wasn't so much because i didn't get it was um you're different from everyone else and i'm here to tell you it's okay to be different it's okay to stand out you don't have to be like everyone else it's okay to be you it's okay to polish that diamond and to be you but to be the best you that you can be and whoever tells you you can't do it however fucked up you think you were i was probably even more fucked up than you and found a way out and to be successful and to use that as my driving force to propel me to help other people get out of it rapidly and not take 16 to 18 years to do so so that was my um that was my origin story i've been hypnopunk this has been unstuck transformations with edge and um what i'm offering um is three power sessions and what a power session is folks is three 30 minutes over the phone or skype with me where we talk about a particular issue that you have and some potential ways that i might be able to help you to overcome it once and for all whether that be addiction problems emotional problems uh, something you want to get over something you want to get more of in your life but i'm offering that now for the next month it is free and all you've got to do to claim your spot is send me an email at mail M-A-I-L at Luke Gnosis, L-U-K-E-N-O-S-I-S dot com. Mail at Luke Gnosis dot com. Tell me you listen to the podcast. Tell me 
why you want to have that 30 minute power call and how you think I can help you and then we'll, we'll book that with you and um, take it to the next level also if you listen to this if you're enjoying the podcast as much as I enjoy recording them then please do go to iTunes and do leave a five star review because we want to get more people listening to this and spread the word that change is coming I've been Luke Michael Howard and this has been Unstuck and of course my podcast name here that I sometimes forget is Hypnopunk Have a great night, day, morning, afternoon, wherever you are, guys. And I will speak with you very, very shortly.